One of the extreme examples of this, to illustrate how we learn language from our past experience, the Lord's Prayer has had to withstand considerable abuse, especially from children trying to learn it from poor enunciators or from mumbling congregations. One little boy was heard to pray, Herald be thy name. Another begged, Give us this day our jelly bread. A New York child petitioned, Lead us not into Penn Station. <laughs> well, we must realize that words are ambiguous, number one, that meanings are determined not by a dictionary. How many of you are taught in high school that we learn the meanings of words from a dictionary? And this perpetuates what we call the container myth, the my mythical assumption that words contain meaning. But remember this, Words don't mean anything. And this is the older school of thought. And sometimes they are teaching this in our English classes. Words don't mean anything. People mean. Meanings are not in words. They are in you. You are the container of meaning, not words. Now, this is not just a semantic quibble, because this has tremendously important business, interpersonal communication applications. All right, what do I mean by this? This means that speakers speak with their meaning and listeners listen with their meaning. Here's one example here of what we mean by projection. Projection or misunderstanding. Projection or bypassing. Going from San Francisco to Chicago by air, I was engrossed in a book on bridge when the stewardess stopped and looked over my shoulder. Mr. Sill, she said, that must be a fascinating love story you are reading. Startled, I looked at the chapter heading with fresh eyes. It was entitled, free responses after an original pass. <laughs> well, this is what we mean by projection, where we wrongly project our meaning into the speaker's words. And we do this every day, but we are not conscious of this. We must be taught of how to be conscious of what we are projecting into speaker's words. Now again, can you ever be certain that you know what a speaker means? Hmm? Can you ever be certain that you know what a speaker means? How many of you up until tonight have been orienting your communication in terms of the assumption of certainty? Quite a few of you. And is this one of the answers to your communication problems? This is probably why you have been having misunderstandings. Again, you can never be certain that you know what someone else means. It was lunchtime. The elderly clerk opened his sandwiches, looked at them, and exclaimed bitterly, cheese sandwiches, always cheese sandwiches. Why don't you ask your wife to fix you another kind of sandwich, a colleague asked. Who's married, said the man indignantly. I make these sandwiches myself. The wife was talking to the maid, you know, I suspect my husband is having an affair with his secretary, to w which the maid replied, I don't believe it, you're only saying it to make me jealous. <laughs> you can never be certain <laughs> what another individual means, but if you orient your communication in terms of the assumption of certainty, and isn't this the allness orientation? then don't be surprised if you have misunderstandings. All right, with all of these variables involved, what do we have to do if we're going to get the speaker and the listener on the same channel of communication? The burden for effective communication is upon who? Both of them. Remember that. Of course, we need speakers who are going to be specific and concrete, yes. But we need listeners who will ask the speaker, what do you mean? What do you mean? Now, in our culture, 
Because we have been taught that meanings are in words, that words are the containers of meaning. And if words are the containers of meaning, then logically, if I tell you something, obviously you should know what I mean, right? If you assume that words are the containers of meaning. But words are not the containers of meaning. You are the container of meaning. All of the listeners right now are listening to a different lecture. And you as a speaker, you as a listener, must realize the ambiguity of language, the variability of meaning inside of the nervous system of everyone. This is why you as a listener, you must ask the speaker, what do you mean? But the trouble is, in our culture, we take it as a personal affront. If someone asks us, what do you mean? Sometimes we either state overtly or imply by the tone of our voice, why, you damn fool, I just told you what I mean. So we need listeners with a non-allness orientation. We need listeners who will ask the speaker, for example, well, Joe, do you mean that I should do such and such? Gene, am I right in assuming that you want me to do such and such? Keep yourself from the ignorance, ignorance is lack of knowledge, and the stupidity. Stupidity is presuming to have knowledge that you don't have. Keep yourself from the ignorance and the stupidity of presuming knowledge that you do not have. This means that we must manifest a non-allness orientation to ask questions. Because, again, the allness-oriented person, they don't ask questions. This is why they have so many misunderstandings. And especially in business and industry, if you have a president of a company at the top that doesn't allow his subordinates to ask him questions, don't be surprised if you'll have an awful lot of misunderstandings. Don't be surprised if you'll have an awful lot of problems internally. Because business and industry corporations are only men doing jobs. Ultimately, you have to get down to the specific man or men working together. And how do they work together? With communication. They either have good communication or poor communication. Effectively working together or ineffectively working together. All right, so we need listeners who will ask, what do you mean? All right, how about the job of the speaker? Does he have a job to do? What should the speaker do? What's that? Do you understand me? Right. Now, the speaker should ask such questions as, Joe, do you know what I wanted you to do? Or something like that. In other words, invite the listener to get on your channel of communication. And this is especially important if you are in a managerial job because your subordinates are afraid of appearing stupid by asking you what do you mean when in actuality this really is stupidity right of going off and misunderstanding you this means that you and i you have to create a non-allness environment you have to create in your business organization and especially you have to create in your home a non-allness orientation for communication. One of these days I'm going to offer a course on effective communication between parents and children. This is where we need the non-allness orientation. This is where we need effective communication to bridge the gap between parents and children, husband and wife, etc. Now, do you see the importance of a non-allness orientation in a business organization? Can you see the difference between the allness and the non-allness? Because if you have people afflicted with allness, it's quite impossible to get them on the same channel of communication. All right, now, how can you apply this? Are there applications to your job? Is this important? Because most of what you do, I am sure, is communication. But we don't realize that it's very easy, really, to solve 70% of our communication problems. How do we do this? If you remember nothing else tonight, 
Remember the importance of asking questions. Remember the importance of asking questions, both as a speaker and a listener. And boy, will you save time, money, and energy. Ask questions. Manifest a non-allness orientation because, again, it's the easiest thing in the world to have misunderstandings. Sometimes, again, we are taught that meanings are in words. The dictionary perpetuates this container myth. For example, I can pour some water in the, almost poured in, in the glass. Is the glass the container of water? Isn't it? The glass contains water. Who or where is the container of meaning? The person, not the word. Now again, as I have said, this is not a semantic quibble, and let me show you why. Let me just erase this to give you an idea of two different modes of communication. Here is mode A. Here we have the speaker, and here we have the listener. All right, the speaker is speaking with his meaning. The listener starts with the assumption that meanings are in words. If you as a listener, and by the way, this is what we are taught in high school, because what I am presenting to you tonight, which is the general semantic consideration of the problem of misunderstanding, isn't this new to most of you, if not all of you? Because in English classes and in high school, we are still talking about the meaning of words, as if meanings were in words. No wonder we have misunderstandings. If you start with the assumption that meanings are in words, then your logic runs something like this. I know what the word means, therefore I know what the speaker means. And you short circuit or you stop the process of communication. Where should your emphasis be? Where should your mind be? On the word or on the speaker? On the speaker. And this is not a semantic quibble. See, here is mode B. Here we have the speaker, and here we have the listener. I, as a listener, I want to know what you mean, not what words mean. Because too often we assume that other people use words as we do if we were doing the talking. And this is not necessarily true, as many of you know. So place your emphasis on the speaker. And if there is one iota of doubt within you, don't be afraid to get on the speaker's channel of communication by asking them, what do you mean? How are you using the word? And I do this an awful lot in the class because I have been trained in working with Dr. Lee and recognizing the ambiguity of language. Words are so tremendously ambiguous. I once went into Dr. Lee and I wanted to give two different kinds of speeches. One, a speech of high order abstractions that I have in my book, by the way, The Speech for All Occasions, and another speech that is specific and concrete. And I wanted to test the understanding of the audience. Dr. Lee was sitting at his desk with his feet up and pipe, smoking his pipe. He says, what do you mean by understanding? Well, any idiot knows what understanding means. Oh, yeah? <laughs> it's only the idiot who assumes he knows what understanding means. Soon Dr. Lee sent me to an article that he had written. He had 11 different definitions of understanding. This is what you and I must learn to do, to realize that words mean many, many different things to become conscious of the ambiguity of language. Now, if you're going to be intelligent in your everyday behavior, what have we covered so far? What do you have to become conscious of? And remember the word conscious. Conscious of. All right, what principles have we covered so far? If you're going to be intelligent, if you're going to have accurate thinking, if you're going to lessen misunderstandings, what do we have to become conscious of? Number one, what? Facts. Good. The difference between facts and words. The word is not the thing. Your orientation should not be controlled by words, 
but by facts. They are not the same. They are obviously on different levels of abstraction. Is this a fact? Is this a fact? This is a nonverbal fact. And again, if you want to go, and I didn't spend all the time on why do we jump to conclusions, the difference between fact and inference. If those of you who bought the book, I went into it much more deeply. But yesterday I was talking about a statement of fact. Is a statement of fact the same as a fact? No. Remember, a statement of fact is on the verbal level, right? This is a nonverbal fact. Then I can make a statement of fact by saying, this, this says, chalk off eraser. Can I make a statement of fact by saying that this was manufactured in uh, Brooklyn, New York? Is that a statement of fact? If it's on there, is that a statement of fact? That it was manufactured in Brooklyn, New York? No, you bet it isn't. But if it says Brooklyn, New York, can I make a statement of fact that it says Brooklyn, New York on the eraser? Can you make a statement of fact that it says Brooklyn, New York on the eraser? No, not until you see it. It's purely inferential to you, right? Okay, so number one, we have to be conscious. The word is not the thing. Number two, we have to be conscious of our signal reactions. Remember that, conscious of our signal reactions. Number three, we have to be conscious of jumping to conclusions. We have to become conscious of the difference between our inferences and statements of fact. Number four, we have to become conscious of our allness orientations. Also, if we are conscious of abstracting and conscious of the etc., we will lessen or eliminate the allness orientations that we have. Become conscious of abstracting. Become conscious of the etc. And try to become conscious of having a non-allness orientation. If we can only train individuals in this kind of an orientation. And again, the most unfortunate thing is this. The ones with the deepest allness orientation, the ones who need this kind of training the most, they are the ones who never are in our management seminars. This is the tragedy in business and industry. Ask individuals questions. Do you think you need, why do you think I said to Ray Huffman yesterday that I was glad to see that Ray was here? Because it's so easy when you become the president of a company or an executive, a top executive, it's so easy to feel that other people need the training and you don't. But when you manifest a non-allness orientation, you realize that the more you learn, you finish the sentence. The more you need to know. This is the non-allness orientation. Some people think that an MD or a PhD degree is the end of learning. But what is it? It's the beginning of learning. This is the non-allness orientation. Notice this example here. Meanings are not in words, they are in us. And you cannot learn, quotes, the meaning of a word from the dictionary. A school teacher told her pupils to listen to their parents' conversation, and if they heard a new word, to look up its meaning in the dictionary and write a sentence using the word properly. The next day she asked Johnny what new word he had learned. He replied that he had heard the word pregnant, which the dictionary defined as to carry a child. The teacher asked Johnny, have you a sentence in which you have used the word? Yes, ma'am, he replied. The fireman climbed the ladder into the burning building and came down pregnant. <laughs> well, meanings are not in words, meanings are in you. As Charles Sanders Pierce, the famous pragmatic philosopher, said, you do not get meaning, you respond with meaning. And there's a tremendous difference between the two. You do not get meaning, you respond with meaning, and this is why we have so many misunderstandings. Now, related to projection and misunderstanding is the importance of listening. We're living in a culture where everyone wants to talk and nobody wants to listen. 
But listening is so tremendously important for effective communication in business and industry, in interpersonal relationships, in life generally. If we ourselves can listen more, if we can only get other people to listen, and we do have to emphasize this, and so I do want to put on the board some of the listening responses that you can give to show the speaker that you are listening to them. This is so tremendously important in business and industry. All right, number one is the nod. And sometimes in talking with you, I'm nodding my head. The nod means, may I say it means four different things, and you have to watch that. Usually, at least, the most important thing, nodding the head, meaning, okay, I'm with you, or I'm listening to you, keep coming, etc. But the danger of the nod is this, that the speaker might wrongfully assume that you agree with him, right? Or even that you understand him, when you don't necessarily. So the nod of and by itself is ambiguous. It can mean many, many different things. But there should be some kind of a listening response to allow the speaker to keep coming, tell me more, I'm with you, to show some empathy with the speaker. All right, so the nod is a good technique. Number two is the pause. This again is the symbol reaction. And I can think of so many individuals. You are communicating with them, and before you get your first or second word out, they're interrupting you. Right? Well, how can you communicate with individuals? How can you listen to them unless you hear them out? Unless you pause? And this was one of my criticisms of argumentation and debate in college or in high school. In fact, this is one of the areas that I worked in the, my doctor's degree. And when I see the debates on television, and I'm not going to give you a whole semantic uh, analysis of modern argumentation and debate, but some of it is good, yes? It trains a person to think logically, to gather evidence, et cetera, et cetera. But some of the training is bad, especially on television, where you will find these debaters who come in the debate with the assumption that their side is right, the other side assumes that they are right, and there's got to be a conflict. Not only that, the thing that I am against relative to this, you'll find one person has a rebuttal. And before the other person can finish their rebuttal, the other debater interrupts him, and before you know it, they have a fight, and they're not even listening to each other. These are unfortunate pedagogical or rhetorical practices. This is a bad way to communicate. So if you're going to have good communication, learn to pause, hear people out, get on their channel of communication. Now, another important thing relative to this is what Dr. Hayakawa in a paper has called a non-evaluative listening response. And we may as well put it right here with a pause, because with a pause, this is all you are doing. You're only pausing. And by a non-evaluative listening response, I mean you are not evaluating what they are saying. Because I see it all the time. You give a lecture to individuals, they come to the class, the first lecture, and they will say, oh, that's a bunch of... <laughs> I don't believe that. Who are they listening to? They're listening to themselves. We don't give the speaker a chance to get to the listener. We jump to conclusions too quickly. And again, as I constantly say, these are the ones who need it the most. They come and they will listen to a lecture or they will listen to you for two minutes, five minutes, and their hearing aid is turned off psychologically. And again, they are the ones who need it the most. By a non-evaluative listening response, Hayakawa means this. I don't prejudge you when I'm listening to you. I'm not saying I don't agree. That's a bunch of etc. I'm listening to you with an open mind from your point of view, not from my point of view. And this takes real training. How can you and I learn to listen 
non-evaluatively. Dr. Carl Rogers calls this empathy. Oh boy, do we need this. Some of the people were asking me, when am I going to offer this course on effective communication between parents and children? And boy, do we need to learn this. How can you and I learn to listen with empathy? By empathy, I mean from the point of view of the child. Learning and listening from his world, not projecting our world into his world, because he is perceiving a completely different world than we are. And boy, do we ever need this in human communication, in business, in industry, parent-child communication, this is why Dr. Hayakawa was brought in, the difference between the black and the white communication, let's say, between the radicals and the moderates, let us say. Communication problems are all about us. Okay, so how can you learn to listen non-evaluatively? And everything that I've been talking about so far, I don't want you to write it down on the piece of paper and have it end there. I don't want you to listen to a lecture and have it end there. I want you to apply it. That's the proof in the pudding. I want to change your behavior, and I hope you will change your behavior, because we all need this kind of training. Okay, a third kind of listening response is the casual remark. You might say, uh-huh, uh or that's interesting. Tell me more. And especially those of you who are in management positions, because all that a subordinate wants sometime is to be listened to. That's all they want. And all you have to do is to listen to them. Uh-huh. That's interesting. If you want to have good human relations in, on your job, you've got to be a good listener no matter what you are doing. We call this poise. The medical doctor who has the bedside manner. We call this poise. I will get into small talk very, very shortly. The dentist or the medical doctor, tremendously important. We don't realize how important communication is. Uh, echo we use this sometime, but not too often. This is repeating the last few words that a person says. Sometimes we can overdo this. I knew a fellow up in Minnesota, for example, an awfully nice guy, and you might say, well, uh, let's go to the uh, theater. He'd say, to the theater. <laughs> let's go, fi go fishing. <laughs> After every one of your sentences, you repeat the last couple of words. Well, this can get too much. But the mirror technique is very, very important. Those of you in business and industry, if you have individuals who have a lot of misunderstandings and they can create problems in your corporation, here's what you should do. Seat them around a table. Here, let's say this is man one or woman two, three, four, five, six, seven, now, the mirror technique is this. Man one will communicate something to man two. Before we allow man two to communicate to man three, man two must repeat back to man one, to man one's satisfaction, what he told him. You see, this is the mirror technique repeating back to the speaker your interpretation of what he said. And when he is satisfied that you understand him, then man two communicates to man three. And before man three can communicate to man four, man three must repeat back to man number two to his satisfaction. And this is a very, very simple kind of a test. But I'll tell you one thing that'll happen your men will be much more conscious of communication. Your men will be much more conscious of why they have misunderstandings. And some of the things that I'm talking about now, you could right now, I am sure, take back to your men and your business and industry, and you could stop maybe 30, 40, maybe even 50% of the communication problems. And when I'm talking about communication problems, I'm not only talking about communication problems. I'm talking about all of the problems in business and industry. Because, quotes, all of them are centered around human evaluation, aren't they? Inaccurate thinking, jumping to conclusions, problems in safety, and I don't care what your job is. I'm talking about human errors, evaluational errors, thinking errors, inaccuracies in our thinking, etc. Please turn the cassette.
So remember the importance of this. Get your people more conscious of their communication failures. And I think you can do this maybe once a week. Bring them in for half an hour and talk to them about some of these problems. You can bring in a communication consultant if you want or dig up your own examples. Make them more conscious of communication, some of the things that we've been talking about here. And I'm sure that you'll cut down an awful lot of the problems that you do have in your own company. Now let me show you again how easy it is, the projection and misunderstanding. Some of you may recall this. This is a real good example of projection, where the listener, listener wrongly projects his or her meaning into the speaker's words. In Cranston, Rhode Island, a motorist here swears this story is true, but even if it isn't, a newspaper would have to be pretty selfish not to pass it along. He was driving toward New York when his car stalled. The battery was dead. He flagged a woman driver, and she agreed to push his car to get it started. Because his car has an automatic transmission, the driver exclaimed, you'll have to get up to 30 to 35 miles an hour to get me started. The lady nodded wisely. The driver climbed into his car and waited and waited. Then he turned around to see where the woman was. She was there, all right, coming at him to 30 to 35 miles an hour. This is projection and misunderstanding. And I think if you analyze why you have had misunderstandings in the past, it's because you wrongly projected your meaning into the another person's words without asking them, what do you mean? Now again, what is that? That's the allness orientation, right? If you have an inkling of an idea that there will be a misunderstanding, ask them, what do you mean? Manifest a non-allness orientation. Yes. How what? This is a good point. How explicit do you need to be in order to make a person understand? Some... I know it can. Yes. Be as specific or concrete as you possibly can. Now, I wasn't going to go into the area of how to be specific and concrete, but seeing that it was raised, let me just give you a hint of an idea, because this is related to this general problem. For example, let me show how words are ambiguous and specific and concrete. Here we have a word chair. Now, that's a fairly specific word, right? It refers to some object in the world of reality. But it can be much, much more specific. We could either say this chair or chair one. Notice this little index. I will talk about this little index. By chair one, I'm talking about the chair that she's sitting on. Now, that is specific as we want to get probably, right? If I want to be more specific yet, I'm talking about that chair right now, not five years ago, because that was a different chair five years ago, assuming that it was in existence as it is now, okay? So if you want to be specific, you have to say when, and you have to be specific and say a specific item. Now, let's go up the order of abstraction, up the abstracting scale. And again, Hayakawa has this in his book, Wendell Johnson in his book, People in Quandaries, there are other books in general semantics that have this and in my own forthcoming book. Now, let's be a little more general. Let's talk about furniture. This is a little more ambiguous, right? It covers more and more. All right, let's use another word that uses chair as a more limited case, but go up the order of abstraction. We can talk about a manufactured item. All right, let's go up the order of abstraction and be more vague yet. And isn't too much of our communication of this variety vague, ambiguous, especially in political rhetoric or sermons, etc.? This is great for political rhetoric. You cannot hold a politician to that which he didn't say in the first place. But the more ambiguous they are, the more we project meaning into their words. Oh boy, we nod our heads. That's the greatest speech in the world. Then you ask the person, what did he say? I don't know. Like the two farmers were listening to this political order and everybody was listening and after an hour or two, one farmer said to the other, said, hey, what's he talking about anyway? 
And the other farmer says, I don't know, he ain't said yet. <laughs> well, too much of our communication is of this variety. It doesn't add much for specific communication. But sometimes if we project too much, people will be satisfied. This is the kind of speech making that I'm talking about with some of our sales seminars or some of the popular lectures. They're very funny, they're very entertaining, but when you leave and you go home, you say, what the heck have I learned? What have I taken home? You know what I'm talking about? And this is one of my criticisms with some of the sales seminars that they have here. And they're very entertaining, they're funny, they're comedians. Very entertaining. But what information have you taken home? And unless you take home some information to be used, you are wasting your time and your money. And I hope that you are not wasting your time and your money here. I hope I'm giving you some answers to your problems or some answers to your questions, because this is the purpose of the seminar, of course. All right, let's go up the order of abstraction. We have furniture, manufactured item, uh, let's say standard brand. <laughs> well, this could f refer to furniture, to chewing gum, to candy, etc., etc. All right? How specific can you get? How do you become specific? Let me give you a very simple answer. If you remember who, what, where, when, why, and how. Write this down, if you will. If you want to be specific and concrete, remember who, what, where, when, why, and how. So remember this if you want to be specific and concrete. Now, how technical should you be? Don't be too technical in everyday communication, unless you have to be. Don't get too technical with individuals, because much of the communication is not scientific. Let me hold that off because I will get to it. Let me get to another principle. Because so far I'm asking you to have accurate thinking. So far I am asking you to be specific and concrete and scientific in your everyday communicating. But there's another important principle. Is this thing changing? Is this thing changing? Are you changing? All right. Many individuals would say no, because you cannot see change on the macroscopic level. This is the macroscopic level. Macro means large. Actually, we can see change, can we, with the human eye. But if we analyze the submicroscopic level of electrons, protons, and neutrons, we know that there is a mad dance, a mad change going on in all matter, right? Submicroscopically terms of electrons, protons, neutrons. Now, let's take certain words. Manager. Science. Education. Building. National defense. Any words that you want. And my real question is this. Do the words that we have in our everyday vocabulary that we use mostly, let's put the name John Jones, and I hope you'll substitute your own name for John Jones. Do the words in our everyday language that we use imply or show the changes to be found in the world of reality? And the answer is no. Now this is what we are concerned with in general semantics because our language has false-to-fact implications. Our language implies a static, non-changing world. But you know doggone well the world of reality is changing. You are changing. Take a look at a picture of you 20 years ago. Tremendous change. Now why is this important? Because we have and we know that science 1930 is not science 1969. Tremendous change. We know in terms of going to the moon, science 1968 is not the same as 1969, right? That's how fast the world of reality is changing. We know that the building business in 1950 is not the same as the building business 1969. 
But the important thing is not only relative to that, but on the personal level, you are not the same person today as you were yesterday. But if you have an allness orientation about yourself, or if you have an allness orientation about somebody else that you don't like, it's the easiest thing in the world to carry over static, non-changing orientations either toward yourself, which is the worst kind, or toward others. When you have been changing and they have been changing, what does the general semanticist want to do? If you're going to make the structure of language fit the structure of the world of reality, we must date our evaluations. We must say when. We know some kids, for example, who go to visit a dentist, and they're afraid. This is auto-suggestion. They act as if the, the dentist hurts them the whole hour, the whole half hour that they are there. They overgeneralize this fear, when in actuality the dentist probably hurts them only one minute out of a 30-minute session. Can you and I learn to date our evaluations? And I have many examples again in my file where some individuals, they didn't like a guy 20 years ago. Maybe you have the same kind of an evaluation. You hated a person 20 years ago. Or you had a certain kind of evaluation toward yourself. I am no good. I have an inferiority complex. I can't sing. I can't dance. I am stupid. And do you know that that kind of evaluation is still in our nervous systems? And we still behave as if we were 5, 10, 15, 20 years old. Now remember this. Date yourself. Are you the same person today as you were yesterday? Are you? Not at all. And the two misevaluations are this. Number one, you and I too often are living in the past. Oh boy. We live in the past. We are failing to date our evaluations if we are living in the past. Or number two, we're afraid of the future. We're acting on an inf inference as if it were a fact. How do you know what the future will hold for you? Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't plan for the future. You bet we've got a plan for the future. But don't be afraid of the future. And too many individuals are afraid of the future. What I'm saying is too many people live either in the past or they're living in the future. When the only world of reality is when? Now. now. And if you date your evaluations, you will automatically live for today. You will live now. And so many people see themselves as failures. They don't say when, as if failure is a part of them. Uh-uh. As soon as you start having some successes, then you'll realize that, gee, I'm not a failure. But the moment we say, I am a failure, we put a period and exclamation point after it as if it will carry through our entire life. If you have that kind of an evaluation, you can be certain that it will. But that is the allness orientation. I am a failure. Okay, let's get back to this again, dating your evaluations. Date yourself. Don't carry over the hate, the prejudice, the dislike, whether it's the hate of others, the prejudice of others, or the dislike of others, and especially the dislike of yourself. You've got to date yourself. If you did not like yourself, and most people in our culture don't, everybody has an inferiority complex. There, there's an awful lot about ourselves that we don't like, right? But you are not the same person today as you were last year. Now, how do we get rid of this? Okay, let's say hypothetically that a young lady or a young man hated a high order, let's say he hates his wife. All right, fine. All right, you go to a psychoanalyst and you find out that he hates his wife. Why? Because he hated his mother. <laughs> okay, at least this was fairly specific. Or we have some men who hate all women. 
Why does he hate all women? Because he hated his mother. Okay, now it is a misevaluation to hate all women, right? Makes no sense. When you and I hate generalizations, there is something wrong with our ways of thinking. This is what general semantics is concerned with. You and I have to learn how to be specific. I know of people who are afraid of dentists. And you DDS is know also, right? They're afraid of all dentists. I know some people who are afraid of all doctors. This is what I mean by unsanity. If you went to a dentist five years ago and he hurt you, it's okay. Be afraid of him. But don't be afraid of all dentists. No, there's something wrong with that too, right? Now I'm asking you to index your evaluations. By index, I mean dentist one or doctor one. Be specific by indexing. All right? So if you hate all women, then we have to index. Where did this hate come from? You hated your mother. All right? The general semanticist says, hate your mother all you want. <laughs> but don't hate all women. No, there's something wrong with that too, right? Because mother, mother 1945 is not mother 1969, right? Is worse? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. But all that we are saying is this. Evaluate people when you are evaluating them. You might have a guy come into your company five years ago and he was terrible. You gave him a psychological test, he was terrible. In the five years, he has changed tremendously. But what do some executives look at? They're still looking at him five years ago. They're still looking at a static profile of a psychological test. They're not looking at the man today. How can you learn to evaluate and re-evaluate your employees? But more importantly is this. How can you learn to evaluate and re-evaluate yourself? That's the most important thing. Don't have a static, non-changing orientation about yourself. I'm not the same person as I was yesterday, or certainly last year. I'm going into X number of fields, and I hope you do too. Expand yourself. None of us are the same. But I know some people who have the same kind of thinking that they did some of your friends. Don't you know some friends? They think and they almost look exactly the same as they did when they were in high school. Right? The same as the farmer who plows the same plot of ground. No change, no expansion, etc. And I think all of you want to get the most out of life that you can. So remember these two principles that are tremendously important. Now there's one more communication principle that is very, very important. So far, we've been talking about how do you be specific, concrete, and scientific. But there is one area where you throw out of the window everything that I've been talking about. And this is in the area of small talk. This is in the area of small talk. How many of you have been taught, or how many of you go in terms of an orientation of, if I don't have something important to say, I shouldn't say anything? Some of you? I used to find this with some engineers. In fact, I had one engineer who came up after a class and said, you know, this one principle was the most important to me. Because I've oriented my life in terms of, if I'm not saying something important, I shouldn't say anything. He said, I used to poo-poo small talk. But this is tremendously important. The purpose of small talk is to bridge the gap of silence. Because what does silence convey? Anyone? Lack of communication, but it conveys more than that. Ignorance, it conveys more than that. At a party, when you should be engaging in small talk, and you do not, what does the other person feel? Hostility. Now let's index the word silence. Let's call this silence one, which is bad. 
See, we have to index words to indicate the ambiguity of, uh, of words, right? Of meanings. Silence one is bad. This is the kind of silence where we do not engage in small talk in a small talk situation. When you should engage in small talk. The ones who, who can use it the most, salesmen, dentists, right? Tremendously important in the medical or dental practice. Tremendously important in selling and establishing rapport. To bridge the gap between individuals. Dr. Hayakawa has called this the language of social cohesion. Social cohesion, bringing groups together. Tremendously important. And the reason I add this is because we are not conscious of the value of small talk. And in Chicago, the best area in the country for small talk, where you can talk about the weather. Because it's always changing. Every day. Mark Twain supposedly said, uh, everybody wants to talk about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. From our point of view, no one should do anything about it. But it's great for small talk. The sweet nothings that you are enunciating to others. Now, the good kind of silence, silence too. This is the good kind of silence. This is where we shut up. Not only overtly, but covertly, inwardly. If we really want to be factual, if we really want to solve problems, you have to stop talking and analyze. This is why I think a lot more of us have to get away and think and read and ponder. Think about new avenues for success or approaches to problems. We're too involved in communication. We're too involved in noise. And any great scholar has to get away and pause and delay and analyze and think. This kind of silence is good. But the kind of silence I'm talking about is the bad kind of silence where we should be talking. Think about that. Do this as an exercise. Pick out one person that you didn't like. Pick out one person you didn't like. Say something complimentary to them. Try that. And before you know it, they will have a different attitude toward you. In fact, this was done once by uh, a Dr. Crane. This was called The Taming of a Boss by His Secretary. Arlene Z, 22, is a stenographer in a large office. A month ago, I decided I would try out your compliment club plan, she smiled. You will told us many times that we should employ, uh, employ a compliment even on our enemies or those we hated. You said that it would produce a miracle for we would soon like the person we had formerly hated. While the man who was my boss had only recently come into the firm, and if ever I disliked a human being, it was this man, he irritated me to such an extent that my digestion was upset, I finally had to go to a physician for aid. He told me it was simply nerves, by the way, never accept that for a medical diagnosis, and advised me to get a different job. But I had an excellent salary, so I had hesitated to make a change. Then I decided that here was the perfect time to try your compliment idea. The next morning, just before I launched on the compliment club plan, my boss made a caustic remark about a typographical error in one of the letters I had typed. It made me more resentful and upset than ever, but I gritted my teeth and within an hour I screwed up enough courage to tell him I thought his tie was one of the most attractive I'd ever seen. This was the truth, much as I begrudged admitting it to him. He simply grunted an acknowledgement of my remark and then said his wife had picked it out. That one compliment exhausted my energy that day. <laughs> so I waited until the next morning before I gave him a second bit of praise. Then I told him I appreciated the fact that he did his dictation in the morning so I would have ample chance to get his letters done before quitting time. I said that many men failed to organize their work like that. He looked up for a moment and half smiled. It was the first time I'd ever seen him look human. <laughs> then he said, you're a very efficient person yourself. I was so dumbfounded, I blushed, and after thanking him, I hurried back to my typewriter. I didn't feel so hostile to my boss that day, and for the first time in weeks, I ate my lunch and enjoyed it. 
The third morning I found it much easier to approach him. I complimented him on not smoking, saying that many a man keeps a cigar hanging out of the corner of his mouth while he dictates. Smoking bosses are often difficult for a girl to understand, especially since she must keep her eyes on her notebook, thus she misses the man's lip movements. Well, he actually smiled then and told me his wife would be glad to hear what I had just said. He also mentioned that he had told her of my compliment about his tie and that she had said I must be a girl with good taste. Later that day, he came out into the office to ask my advice about some new letterheads we were getting printed. Since then, he has let me make many decisions about office supplies and gave me a pair of theater tickets which he and his wife couldn't use. I heard him tell a visitor that I was the best stenographer he had ever had, and I have such a different attitude toward him that I can't believe I used to hate him not six weeks ago. Let us now add some conclusions to the last three principles we've been talking about, how to lessen misunderstandings, how to keep up to date, and the importance of small talk. Relative to the problems of misunderstanding, number one, Become conscious of your projections. Become conscious of the fact that the listener projects his meanings into speaker's words. Number two, remember that words don't mean, people mean. Number three, remember that other people do not necessarily mean what we mean. Number four, we tend to take for granted what someone else means. Number five, we tend to assume too quickly that we know what others mean. Number six, if you do not understand or do not know the answer, do not project. Ask questions. Number seven, we need listeners who are a little more willing to inquire. Number eight, we need listeners who can listen with non-evaluative listening responses. Number nine, we need speakers who are a little more willing to answer questions as well as to check if the listener is on his channel of communication. And finally, number ten, thus we shall be able to lessen misunderstanding among men. Now, in the principles of dating and change, it's important to remember that assuming all timeness or failure to change or date our evaluations, this tends to make us exaggerate more than we should. Assuming all timeness or the failure to date tends to make us peg people without looking to see if they have changed. This is particularly true in police departments. For example, if a policeman makes a mistake, he is pegged for the rest of the time he is in the department. Some of us peg individuals the rest of their life. Also, assuming all timeness promotes the I am a failure attitude. This is one of the most dangerous attitudes relative to failure to date. This leads toward quitting instead of trying to become a success. We unfortunately tend to remember our failures mostly. And assuming all timeness or the failure to date leads toward prejudices, hates, constant dislikes, disagreements and conflicts. And assuming all timeness leads toward generalized unsanity. And relative to the importance of small talk, we must remember that there are important psychological purposes of small talk. There are two kinds of silence. Silence one, that is good, when you are thinking, planning, creating. Silence two is bad, is when you should be talking, engaging in small talk at parties, dinners, social affairs, etc., and remember, don't confuse serious talk with small talk. Each has a different purpose and each is important. Many of us seem to have a reluctance to engage in small talk. Engage in small talk willingly. Practice this consciously and there are great rewards in the ability to engage in small talk.